This BYU devotional by President Thomas S. Monson was given November 2nd, 1975. This evening, we are indeed privileged to have as our speaker, Elder Thomas S. Monson, a member of the Council of the Twelve and a member of the Board of Trustees of this institution. Married to Frances Beverly Johnson, they are the parents of three children. Born and reared in Salt Lake City, Elder Monson is a graduate of the University of Utah, where he earned a degree in business. Following his graduation, he became associated with the Deseret News and later with the Deseret News Press, one of the world's largest commercial printing firms. He was general manager of the Deseret News Press until shortly before his appointment to the Council of the Twelve. He is past president of the Printing Industry of Utah and a former member of the Board of Directors of the Printing Industry of America. He is presently a member of the Utah State Board of Higher Education. His life shows great dedication and service to the Church. He was a bishop at the age of 22, a member of the presidency of the Temple View Stake, president of the Canadian Mission, and is a member of the Mission Executive Committee of the Church as well as other major committees. Elder Monson is a great supporter of Brigham Young University, a devout and devoted spiritual leader, and a friend of youth. We are very blessed and honored to hear from Elder Monson, and we would now like to turn the time over to him. Elder Monson. My brothers and sisters in front of me and on the sides of me and behind me, I am grateful to have the opportunity to be with you this Sabbath evening. It's difficult to place into words the inspiring sight which you represent this evening here in the Marriott Center. I pray that our Heavenly Father will bless me, that I may be able to present some thoughts and discuss some subjects that would be of benefit to each one of you. The spirit of that great centennial convocation still lingers in the Marriott Center. I believe, President Oaks, that I've never been more proud of you than on that occasion where you conducted that convocation. I think that I've never been uh, more amused by a roll call than the roll call which you conducted that day. You may remember that you asked all of those of the original graduating classes to stand, and a few people stood. Then you asked those who had graduated more recently to stand, and a few more stood. And then you gave them the large question, and all future graduates of the Brigham Young University please stand, and you brought the house down. <laughs> I'd like to look into your faces tonight and ask for a show of hands how many of you are married. May I see your hands? I won't look into the right here. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Now, how many of you hope to be married? Oh, my. Very good. One man put it this way. He said, before marriage, a man is incomplete. And after marriage, he's finished. <laughs> Now, lest you young men get the best of me, I think I might tell you of the woman who said to her depressed husband who was a student, what do you mean you have nothing to live for? The home isn't paid for, the car isn't paid for, the TV isn't paid for. And then there's the young man who complained about his wife's biscuits. He said to his dear wife, I wish you could bake biscuits like my mother. She was tired of hearing this, and she said, and I wish you could make dough like my dad. <laughs> well, now we're going to talk about things that are more important than burned biscuits or uh, how much money a person may have. We're going to talk about you and about a particular passage of Scripture that comes from 1 Peter, wherein he declared, Ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the destiny 
of every Latter-day Saint in this room if he or she will but live for the fulfillment of that destiny. When the Savior was upon the earth, he taught many of us, all of us in actual fact, with the use of parables. Remember the parable he taught of the wise and the foolish virgins who were instructed to fill their precious lamps with oil. And you recall that five prepared properly, five did not prepare. And then came the day when the bridegroom came, and there was no additional oil to fill the lamps of those who had come unprepared. And the rebuke of the Master on that occasion, you remember it? Verily I say unto you, I know you not. A great lesson in preparation. And then you remember the parable of the talents, how one was given five talents, another four, three, two, and so forth, and how pleased was the Master with those individuals who had multiplied their talents and had put them to good use, and how unhappy he was with the person who had one talent, and who, out of fear of losing that one talent, buried it in the ground. Oh, that rebuke was one which would sting as well, wherein we heard this word, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. And then do you remember the plea of the Lord himself, when he looked upon his beloved people in Jerusalem and uttered that cry which is found in the Holy Scripture in the book of Matthew, and then again in the book of Luke as well, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. And then the rebuke, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And then finally the parable of the fig tree. You may recall that the fig tree had leaves but no fruit. And, of course, the tree was commanded never to produce again. And the people marveled at how quickly the leaves did wither and how suddenly the tree faded away. Remember that particular rebuke, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And as I've indicated, the response of those who observe the fulfillment of this command, how soon is the fig tree withered away? From those parables, I'd like to suggest that if we are really to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, we have the responsibility to be prepared, to be productive, to be faithful, and to be fruitful as well. What we need as we journey along through this period known as mortality is a compass to chart our course, a map to guide our footsteps, and a pattern whereby we might mold and shape our very lives. And tonight I'd like to share with you a formula which in my judgment will help you and help me to journey well through mortality and to that great reward of the celestial kingdom of our Heavenly Father. Brigham Young University is a part, a very vital part, of that journey. When you come to Brigham Young University, you represent the hopes and the dreams of your parents. I've been in their homes. I was in the presence of our fine state clerk in Evansville, Indiana, just a week ago, or two ago, and his final word to me as he handed me all of the multitude of papers which happened to go with the creation of a new stake. With a tear in his eye, he said, I have two of our daughters at Brigham Young University. Would you give them my greetings? And so to you fine young ladies and to the children of our people, our faithful people throughout the world, I bring you their love and bring you their greetings and the hope they have in their hearts that at Brigham Young University you will learn well those lessons which will augur 
for your success. Now the parts of my formula which I should like to share with you tonight. Part one, fill your mind with truth. Part two, fill your life with service. And part three, fill your heart with love. Let's talk about each one of the parts of the formula and see if each one does not have a lodgment right within the human breast. Point one, fill your mind with truth. I'd like to suggest that when we search for truth, we search among those books and in those places where truth is more likely to be found. I've often referred to a little couplet, a little thought that I have kept within my heart as a firm belief. You do not find truth groveling through error. You find truth by searching the holy word of God. One day on this very campus, I was conducting some interviews. It was over in the language training mission, elders and sisters. And between interviews, I happened to take a triple combination and was reading from it while I was waiting for the next young man to come into the room. And I looked on the flyleaf of the triple combination and lo and behold, I found that that particular triple combination had belonged to the deceased daughter of President Harold B. Lee. And there I noted on the flyleaf that he had written a message to his precious daughter, a message from him as her father. I'd like to share with you the thought which President Lee felt was most important to share with his daughter. He wrote, To my dear Maureen, that you may have a constant measure by which to judge between truth and the errors of man's philosophies and thus grow in spirituality as you increase in knowledge, I give you this sacred book to read frequently and cherish throughout your life. Lovingly, your father, Harold B. Lee, April 9, 1944. The book had been well-read and well-used and well-learned, for which I am sure President Lee was most grateful. Search the scriptures, my dear brothers and sisters, and you will fill your mind with truth. Frequently, if we turn elsewhere for our learning, if we turn to man's philosophies, we can get a little smattering of truth, but not the whole picture, and sometimes Truth in the ways of man is based upon such a shallow foundation. I like to think of the story of the monkey who was in a cage in a particular location where an airplane would fly over frequently inasmuch as the cage and the master were situated on the flight pattern near a large airport. The monkey became terrified initially as the plane would fly overhead and in his fright, he would rattle the bars of his cage. And pretty soon, he realized that as he rattled the bars of his cage, the airplane would fly away, and he would be safe. And in his little mind, I'm confident that he felt that rattling the bars of the cage would cause the monkey rather to feel that the airplane, out of fear of him, had flown away and left him alone. Consequently, that so-called truth would perhaps lodge in his animal mind, when in reality all of us know that the rattling of the bars of the cage had little to do with the departure of the airplane. And so it is with man's philosophies. We need to turn to the truth of God. I like the words of the author of that all-time classic, Little Women, Louisa May Alcott, who wrote, I do not ask for any crown but that which all may win, nor try to conquer any world except the one within. You and I have a responsibility to learn the Word of God, to understand the Word of God, and then to live His Word. And by so doing, we will find that we have learned and accepted the truth. 
I like the words, too, of the prophet Joseph Smith. He was a man of few words when he needed to make a direct point. He simply said, when I find out what God wants me to do, I do it. Isn't that simple? And then I like the words, too, of Brother David Kennedy. I was talking to him the other day in the church office building and reminded him of a statement he made when he was called to be the Secretary of the Treasury. In an interview with one of the United Press reporters, he boldly declared, I believe in prayer and I pray, teaching the entire world that truth can come when one seeks help from his Heavenly Father. Do you remember how Ella Wheeler Wilcox best described the journey that you and I happen to be taking? She said, one ship sails east and another west with the selfsame breeze that blows. It's the set of the sail and not the gale that bids them the way that they go. Like the ways of the sea are the ways of fate as we journey along through life. It's the set of the soul that determines the goal and not the calm nor the strife. This is a day when time is precious. This is a time when we can't afford not to be engaged in an earnest search for truth. My dear brothers and sisters, will you join me in a personal commitment that I indeed will fill my mind with truth. Then let's look at the second part of that formula. Fill your life with service. From Mosiah, when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Harry Emerson Fosdick, the Protestant minister, said that men will work hard for money and men will work harder for other men. But then he declared, men will work hardest of all when they are dedicated to a cause. Until willingness overflows obligation, men fight as conscripts rather than following the flag as patriots. Duty is never worthily performed until it is performed by one who would gladly do more if only he could. Each one of us has an assignment in the Church, I'm sure, and each one has an opportunity to render service to others. And the missionary battalion on my right has a wonderful opportunity to give of their full time in sharing that commodity of such priceless value, a testimony of the gospel with all of the world. And to you young men, may I declare as you go forward to render this service that you have been called of God by prophecy, and you are divinely commissioned and sent forth in your sacred calling. It has been my opportunity for a number of years to serve as a member of the Missionary Executive Committee, to sit in the presence of President Kimball and other members of the committee every Tuesday morning, to hold in my hand the missionary recommendation for each one of you and read what your bishop may have said about you what your stake president may have said about you as you have been recommended for missionary service. Sometimes some very unusual things are said about you. <laughs> I remember on one occasion a bishop had written, This young man is very close to his mother. She hopes that he will be sent to a nearby mission, that she may have the opportunity of telephoning him every Saturday night and perhaps visiting him during her summer vacation. <laughs> President Kimball pondered that thought and then, under inspiration, assigned that young man not to a mission in California or a mission in Oregon or Washington, to the South Africa mission he went. <laughs> no telephone calls, no visits, just missionary work. And then I shall never forget the one where the bishop had written, this young missionary will be the most outstanding missionary in the field. He has been the president of his deacon's quorum, president of the teacher's quorum, valedictorian of his graduating class in school. He lettered in track and football, has been the recipient of the Duty to God Award. 
He is the most outstanding young man I've ever recommended. He said, P.S., I am proud to be his father. <laughs> Now, I don't know just where he went, <laughs> but he did go. In a more serious vein, may I bear testimony to you young men and young women and some just a little older than young, may I let you know that there is inspiration in the calling which you receive. I'll give you but one, ex one example. I remember having read the detail on a particular missionary candidate, and President Kimball indicated that the young man would go, I believe, to London, England. And then he said, no, no, that is not correct. Send that young man to the Denmark-Copenhagen mission. And then I looked on the form, and I had overlooked reading a very important statement from the stake president. I said, President Kimball, have you ever seen this form before? He said, no. I said, look what the stake president has written. The grandfather of this missionary candidate is an immigrant from the land of Denmark. He is our stake patriarch, and the missionary candidate was promised in his patriarchal blessing that if he lived true and faithful, he would return to the land of his forebears that he might preach the gospel in that particular land. And President Kimball nodded his head and said, The Lord's will has been made known today. So young men and young women, Go forward knowing that you are in the service of God, that you are going to share that most precious commodity, your testimony, remembering that a testimony is perishable. That which you selfishly keep, you'll lose, but that which you willingly share, you'll keep. And as you go forward in this calling, and as each one of us goes forward in his calling or her calling, may I urge that we magnify the callings which we have. John Taylor, president of the Church, said that if we fail to magnify our callings, God will hold us accountable for those whom we might have saved had we done our duty. Have you ever stopped to contemplate what the word magnify means with reference to a calling in the Church? When you were set apart, Perhaps you heard the phrase, may you magnify your calling. I read in the church history where one of the early brethren came to the prophet and said, Brother Joseph, frequently you use the term, magnify your calling. Just what do you mean? And Joseph replied, when a man magnifies his calling, he builds it up in dignity and importance so that the light of heaven may shine through his performance to the gaze of other men. An elder magnifies his calling as an elder when he learns what his duty is and then when he performs it. I would hope that that would be the spirit that each one of us would have as he embarks on a humble and an earnest quest to fill his life with service. All of us remember and love a general authority who departed from us some time ago, Brother William J. Critchlow. I was particularly fond of Brother Critchlow. I had the opportunity of accompanying him and Sister Critchlow to a number of quarterly conferences when I was a member of the priesthood committees. And I recall vividly Brother Critchlow relating a simple little story which taught me a never-to-be-forgotten lesson about doing one's duty, about rendering service to one's fellow man. It was kind of a fairy tale, yet it had the ring of profound truth. The story was about, about a young man named Rupert. Rupert lived in the high mountain country. His vocation? Very simple. He cared for the sheep and the goats which belonged to the tiny flock which his grandmother had. Rupert's mother and father were dead. Every morning, Rupert would take the sheep and the goats to the mountain pastures, watch them throughout the day, perhaps midway through the day, take them to the little brook from whence they would obtain sufficient water, and then in the evening would bring them home. One day, however, 
a courier went through all the little villages, including the one where Rupert lived, and posted a bulletin upon a large tree in each village, a bulletin that indicated that the precious emerald of the king of the land had been lost. The king had been out riding horseback, and the emerald had torn away from the chain which held it about his neck, and had been lost, and much anxiety had been occasioned the king. And then a fabulous reward was posted for whomsoever could retrieve the king's emerald. And Rupert said to his grandmother, I'm going to go search for the king's emerald because I know if I should find it and should obtain the reward, you could live with more comfort than we're able to provide through the small flock of sheep and goats which I tend. And grandmother said to him, No, Rupert, if you should go on a search for the king's emerald, who would tend the sheep and who would tend the goats? And then she counseled him to go about his daily work. Rupert followed his grandmother's advice. He took the sheep and the goats to the mountain pasture as he had done every day, and then as the day warmed, he brought them down to the clear and the cool waters of the friendly brook. And as he, as boys are wont to do, lay prone on his stomach that he might drink his fill of those clear, cool waters, he noticed something sparkling within the brook. He thought for a moment, could it possibly be? And he plunged his hand into the stream and brought forth the king's emerald. Clutching it tightly, he ran all the way home to his grandmother and said, Grandmother, I have found the king's emerald. I have found the king's emerald. Whereupon he then explained to her, Perhaps as the king's horse jumped the brook, the emerald fell from the chain which held it about the king's neck. But I have it now within my hand, and the reward shall be yours. And then his grandmother took him aside and said to Rupert, Remember, my boy, you never would have found the king's emerald had you not been performing your duty. I leave that simple lesson with you tonight. Do your duty, that is best. Leave unto the Lord the rest. And now our third part of the formula. Fill your heart with love. That isn't difficult for any student within the sound of my voice in the Marriott Center this evening. We can turn to almost any activity and find a lesson worthwhile with respect to filling one's heart with a true and an abiding love. We just finished, as you know, a World Series, a World Series which was very exciting, one where two teams were very evenly matched. I thought back as I watched one game and perhaps two games of the series of a statement which one of the greatest home run hitters of all time had made concerning a lesson in his life. He didn't talk too much about home runs. He talked about his father. And the ball player was Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron did not have very much of this world's goods when he was a tiny boy. But he loved baseball. Baseball consumed his life. And he said that he and his father used to sit in an old car, an abandoned car that was in the rear of their lot, and they'd talk hour after hour. And one day Hank said to his dad, I'm going to quit school, Dad. I'm going to go to work so I can play baseball. And Herbert Aaron said to his son, My boy, I quit school because I had to, but you're not going to quit school. He said, Every morning of your life I put 50 cents on the table that you might buy your lunch that day. <coughs> And I take 25 cents with me that I might buy my lunch. Your education means more to me than my lunch. I want you to have what I never had. Hank Aaron said every time he thought about quitting school, he thought of that 50 cent piece which his father put on that table every day, the only meal that Hank had that day. He thought how much that 50 cents meant to his father and then in his own mind calculated how much his schooling meant to his father. 
Hank Aaron said, I never had too much difficulty staying in school when I reflected upon the love which my father had for me. He said, as a result of reflecting upon that love of my father, I obtained my schooling and I played a lot of baseball. That was putting it mildly to the greatest home run threat that ever stepped upon the diamond, Henry Aaron. We can turn from Hank Aaron. We can turn to a UPI news release, which I read just a short time ago, from Los Angeles. A blind father rescued his tiny daughter from drowning in the new swimming pool that had been installed in the neighborhood. And then the story went on to describe just how this had been accomplished. The blind father had heard the splash when his little girl fell into the pool. Frantic, he could not see her. He wondered how he might help her. It was evening and she was the only one in the pool. He got upon his hands and knees and crawled around the side of the pool and listened for the air bubbles which came from that little girl who could not swim as she actually was in the process of drowning. And then, with a heightened sense of hearing, he followed carefully the sound of those air bubbles, and then in one desperate attempt with love in his heart and a prayer within his soul, jumped into that pool and grabbed hold of his precious daughter and brought her to the side and rescued her. Talk about love and the miracles which love can bring about. Oh, I want to bear testimony that there's room for each one of us to demonstrate a real share of filling one's heart with love. I like to think of Abraham Lincoln, one of the great presidents of our country. He also was one of our greatest writers and orators. I think that I've never read words which better describe the love which a man can have for others than the love which he described inadvertently, really, as he penned a letter to a mother, a mother who had lost all of her sons in the Civil War. It's known as the Lydia Bixby letter. Listen carefully to the words of Abraham Lincoln and see if you don't feel within your heart the love which filled his. Dear Madam, I have just been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of a republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours very sincerely, and respectfully, A. Lincoln. Have you ever thought, my fellow students, as you have sat in the classrooms of Brigham Young University, that you are occupying the chair that another may have occupied had he not given his life for his country? Have you ever thought, as you participate in an athletic event, that you perhaps are taking the place of one who with all of his heart wanted to return from the field of battle once again to participate on the field of athletics. I think that we fill our hearts with love when we remember those who have given so very much that we might enjoy the blessings which we have. I pay respect and tribute to each of them. I know, too, that there are a lot of people who are underprivileged, other people who have deformities, other individuals who are slow of learning. How better could you show your love for the person who's having difficulty in school 
than by taking him aside and giving him a little private tutoring. You know, as you help another toward the top of the hill, you're just bound to be a little closer to the top yourself. I think that a very simple illustration reflects a lesson in love that I'd like to share with you tonight. I found it in some of the reading for the teacher development program of the Church. How a man went out to his front yard and tacked up a sign, Puppies for Sale, and every boy in the neighborhood came to see the puppies. It seems like a sign, Puppies for Sale, instinctively brings something out in the heart of a boy. And one little feller got hold of the man and said, How much are the puppies you have for sale? And the man said, Oh, they're good pups. They'll run anywhere from thirty-five to sixty dollars. And the boy looked dejected. And the owner of the dog said to him, How much do you have? He said, Two dollars and thirty-seven cents. And then he called the mother dog, Lady, he said, and she came out of the kennel with the little balls of fur following behind her. One lagged way behind and seemed to have a little difficulty walking. And the little boy said to the man, I'd like to buy that little pup in the rear. I'd like to give you my $2.37 and pay the rest as I happen to get it. The owner of the dog said, Oh, you wouldn't want that particular pup. He has a deformed hip socket. He'll never be able to run and play with you as a boy would want a puppy to run and play with him. Whereupon the little lad carefully lifted his pant leg and revealed a double brace running down each side of his leg, held in place by the leather cap on the knee. And then the little fellow said to the owner of the dogs, He's going to need a lot of love and a lot of care. He's going to need someone who understands him. He's the dog I'd like to have. I don't know the outcome of that story. But I'd venture to say that that man gave to that boy, without taking his $2.37, that precious little puppy. And that boy demonstrated by that statement an abundance of love which frequently is found in the heart of a child and can be emulated by every adult who knows that child. Today in our sacrament meeting, we sang the hymn I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me, confused at the grace which so fully he proffers me. I tremble to know that for me he was crucified, that for me a sinner he suffered, he bled, and died. I think of his hands pierced and bleeding to pay the debt. Such mercy, such love, such devotion can I forget. No, no, I will praise and adore at the mercy seat until at the glorified throne I kneel at his feet. I stand all amazed, my brothers and sisters, at the love Jesus offers me and the love Jesus offers you. I think of the love which he provided in Gethsemane. I think of the love which he provided out in the wilderness. I think of the love he provided at the tomb of Lazarus, of the love he demonstrated on Golgotha's hill, at the open tomb, and, yes, when he appeared in that sacred grove with his father and spoke those words to Joseph Smith. I thank God for his love in sharing his only begotten Son in the flesh, even Jesus Christ, for you and me. I thank the Lord for the love which he demonstrated by providing his life that we might have life eternal. Jesus is more than a teacher. Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's the Redeemer of all mankind. He is the Son of God. He showed the way. You may recall that Jesus filled his mind with truth, and Jesus filled his life with service, and Jesus filled his heart 
with love. When we follow that example, we shall never hear those words of rebuke that I mentioned earlier, those words which came from the parables. We shall never find that we have empty lamps. We shall never discover that our homes have been left unto us desolate. We shall never determine that we have been found unfruitful in the kingdom of God. Rather, when you and I follow carefully the steps of that formula and literally fill our minds with truth and fill our lives with service and fill our hearts with love, we are going to hear perhaps the whisper, sometimes more loudly, that statement of the, the Savior given to you and to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. My prayer tonight is that we may so conduct ourselves that we may merit that plaudit from our Lord and Savior. I pray with all of my heart that each one of us may so live that he may qualify for the blessing which the Lord also gave in that 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants when he declared, I, the Lord, am merciful and gracious unto those that fear me and delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth unto the end. Great shall be their reward, and eternal shall be their glory. God bless you, my precious brothers and sisters, and may our Heavenly Father bless you, President Oaks. You are a giant oak here on the campus of Brigham Young University, and I want you to know that I speak the sentiments of each of the brethren when I say that we're very pleased and thankful to our Heavenly Father that at this particular time, in the history of our world and the history of our country, we're grateful that our Heavenly Father has provided for you and for all others at the Brigham Young University the leadership of Dallin Oaks. We're grateful to you, Brother Oaks, and pray our Heavenly Father's blessings to be with you and each of the students who calls himself a man from Brigham Young or a woman from BYU. God bless each of you. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This BYU devotional by President Thomas S. Monson was given November 2, 1975.